I basically made the decision to leave what was a pretty cush situation to start something new. For whatever reason, that one did not pan out. And I found myself thinking, do I want to, is there another great idea out there? Move over, baby boomers. It's time for Gen XYZ. It's time to stop waiting on the world to change. It's time to be the change. It's time to stop thinking about how your life can be better. It's time to start taking action, massive action to improve your life. Join Zach Winner and Mark Adair Reels every week as we learn how others have the grit, determination, and conviction to 10x their lives, and as we explore ways that can help you 10x your life. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the 10x for Gen XYZ podcast. I'm Zach Winner. And I'm Mark Adair Rios. And today as our guest, we have my brother, Ethan Winner on. And I'm really excited to have Ethan on, not just because he's my brother and we can shoot the shit and, and, <laughs> and rib each other. But I thought it would be great to have you on, Ethan, because uh, of your entrepreneurial experience. Ethan um, founded a tech startup back in 2014, Ethan? That's right. Although it seems like it was just yesterday. I know it goes by quick. And so, you know, a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs or are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs or are thinking about ways to transition out of a W-2 uh, employee situation into more of an entrepreneurial situation, which is what you did. It's, it's what I did. And Mark is also an entrepreneur. So, um, so that's why we wanted to have you on. Yeah. And you know, it's really interesting just, just to kind of add to that is not only are people, you know, really kind of getting their entrepreneurial juices going, but they're also in a position where they see startups happening all the time. And even if there's wishful thinking in this whole so-called unicorn um, era that we're in, you know, people come up with ideas and it's, e it's easier than ever to start a business, even something online or even a, a product that you can have manufactured. It's never been a better time to, to start your own business, like a, a real kind of um, visionary business than that's now, right. you know, that's it doesn't right. have to it's be incredible. a brick and mortar, you know, let me, let me go and sell, you know, hot dogs on the corner. It can be just about anything right now. Yeah. So that's great. It's a great know. time. I mean, it, it, we seem to be at this precipice where tech is blossoming and venture capital is everywhere. And I read some stat about the amount of venture capital funds out there now, and it's just blown away prior years. So, yeah. um, right. But the, but the fundamentals of a good idea, executing on that idea, finding the right go-to-market strategy and distribution channels, these things at the core still have to have this great foundation. You know, it's sort of like if you're creating ideas for entertainment, for a new TV series or a movie, you think there are so many platforms now, you know, outside of the broadcast, all the streaming platforms. But what that's done on the opposite side is it's brought everybody out who has an idea and mm -hmm you know, Microsoft Word to create a script. So yes, you have a hundred times more of the possibilities, but you have a thousand times more competition. Yeah. I think the same thing is true on the, on the venture side or entrepreneurship side. A lot of great ideas are out there. There's a lot of money yeah. to fund the initial stages, but the amount of competition is, is, is immense and intense. So you still have to, you know, you have to do your homework, right? You have to put together the right team and the right the right platform to get it to get it to market. Totally. Yeah, let's take a step back and and talk about you know what your business is, what Elucio is, and what the technology is. So, Elucio is is a it's predominantly a medical software platform based on augmented reality and and visualization. So, without seeing that, just describing it. It's when a patient is able to see what the possibilities are, in our case, for plastic surgery and even breaking it down even more, breast augmentation. So if you're a woman and you're considering breast implants, you would go to see a plastic surgeon. Traditionally, you would talk about what you want to look like. You would maybe look at before and after pictures of other patients. But that's not taking advantage of the technology that we have available today. So we decided let's create a platform where a surgeon can first capture a 3D rendering of an actual patient's breast. We could process that in our platform and then using augmented reality, which is basically 
the combination of a digital image and the real world, we superimpose the capturing of the patient's breast on top of her. She's looking in a virtual mirror, which is basically a fancy word for a TV that's streaming an image from an iPad. Mm -hmm. So she can see herself. She can move side to side. She can see this rendering of her breast, which basically looks like she's looking in a mirror. And then in real time, a doctor, simply by using an iPad and dragging their finger on the iPad display, can change her breast as she's looking at them to basically create a visual communication modality so that instead of just talking about ideas, they're visually communicating back and forth, trying to get to that, you know, that end goal of that's what I want to look like. And the surgeon saying, given your unique body, I can, I can deliver that. That's, yeah. It's so cool. I mean, it really is using virtual reality to enable the patient and the doctor to decide, you know, what type of breast augmentation they want to have. And it's, I've seen the technology. It's incredible. I mean, it really looks like you're looking in a mirror and, and you can move the iPad to different angles so you can see all different angles of looking at your body essentially through a virtual mirror. Right. So, I mean, when a, when a woman looks into a mirror with or without this technology, regardless of breast augmentation, they're constantly moving, right? They want to see themselves from all different angles. So we needed to keep that intact. At the end of the day, if you're talking about visualization, it really isn't about providing a clinical tool to a surgeon. It's about improving the experience for the patient. So you want to make it as experiential and as real as possible. And you yeah. mentioned it's a, it's a, it's a software base. So is there a device other than the iPads that you need to kind of, you know, send out to each doctor when they kind of sign up for it or, or is it basically two iPads, one, you know, that they look into and one that's kind of recording, um, recording the movement. How, yeah, how does that good, work? No, it's a good question, Mark. Right now. And this is, you know, everything changes and we can talk about what Apple's doing to grab every market out there. That's, you know, associated with their type of technology. Uh, it, the platform runs on an iPad. All of the storage is cloud-based. We use what's called marker-based tracking. So when we create this image, in order for the iPad to know where to place the image, we simply have a, it's an elastic band that a patient puts around her chest. And there's a little marker that's on basically a five by seven inch card that's affixed mm -hmm. to that bando. We send that stuff out. The only hardware that's required is a 3D scanner to capture that image in the first place. And that scanner attaches to an iPad is relatively small, it's not expensive. Um, but with that said, we are developing, you know, this technology to operate off of the cameras that are now on every iPhone Fantastic. 12, every iPhone 13 and moving forward. So the technology to do full 3D capture is part of every single iPhone right now that's out there. It's, it's, that's it's great. And it's going to be integrated into all kinds of technology you can't even think of in terms of the ability to create 3D environments simply yeah. from a phone. And so, so just going with that, if I'm using my 10X mind in a little way, it sounds like you guys are trying to possibly look towards a future where, where the, the potential patient can do this at home. And they can then, you know, lock in whatever it is that they like and upload that to their doctor and say, hey, this is what I want right here. Can you do it? Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's an interesting dialogue to have. Um, we are trying to optimize smartphone technologies so people can use this at home. You know, there are, then you get into this idea of what, from a business or a strategic perspective, if we're trying to create a platform to properly manage expectations, which means really when a surgeon and a patient speak, whose image is going to, is going to be the one to, yeah. it's the doctors, it, you know, the, the doctor, because of their experience, they can envision on the patient, what potential outcomes are. We are giving them a platform to communicate that image with their patient. If the patient was to control the expectations more times than not, they would create an unrealistic <laughs> You know, a lot of, not everybody can look like, you know, a Cindy Crawford playboy centerfold or, or whatever. Um, but most women, when they are thinking about any kind of plastic surgery or anybody thinking about plastic surgery, you know, they're, they're thinking about in a perfect world, what would I want to look like? 
That's why so, you have to have those those triggers. Matt can't do that. Matt, right. No, too big. Right. Matt, too small. <laughs> so the technology allows for that. At least what we are developing now. It's yeah. going to be a real question of what do we allow the patients to do at home versus this, this part has to be controlled by the surgeon. Yeah, um, interesting. Interestingly, I was on this morning, uh, another Zoom with a huge plastic surgery clinic in the United Kingdom, and, and all they cared about was what can we do so that they can do more work out of the office, but the patients at home, because every time a patient's in the office, that costs money. Interesting. So, decrease patient time. It's like dentist, you know, the, the, um, the holy grail in dentistry is how much can we do without taking up chair time? Right. Chair time is so limited. So same thing across the entire medical field. The more that, that, that the medical field is able to do medical practitioners, the more they can do without having the patients in office, the more patients they can take through the system and the more revenue they can generate. Right. Right. And so, um, you know what I'd love to do is just spend a couple minutes talking about your transition from um, your prior life when you were a W-2 employee and your decision to start this business and, and kind of what that process was um, just to help our listeners kind of visualize the thought process that you went through. No, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting one too. Um, and it's funny, before getting into that, I had another call today. I just got invited today to be on, on a, an advisory board for the University of California at Santa Barbara, UCSB, mm. um, to, to be an advisor to one of their new executive leadership programs, talking about exactly this. How can I help speaking and mentoring younger people who are going through that process? And, and exactly what you said, Zach, you know, people who are W-2 employees thinking about making that jump into something entirely new, right? Why do you think about doing it? Most people is because complacency, maybe unhappiness, maybe they're, they think that their potential is very limited as a W-2 employee. And they want the possibility to create that American dream and build something and maybe even make a lot more money. Um, all of those things go through our heads as entrepreneurs. Um, and I was in that. I mean, I spent 20 years in public affairs and corporate communications. Um, I, I got to see the world many times over, dealing mostly with international clients. Um, and it was a wonderful, probably 10 years. The next, you know, the next 10 years, though, it became a grind. Yeah. And um, I had young kids, as you know, and it took its toll. I wasn't seeing them that much. And, um, and I felt like, you know, if you have a lot of ideas and you're a W-2 employee, there are there you are very limited in terms of what you can do because you know let's face it you're really controlled by the powers that be that are above you. Yeah, it's really hard. Like everybody has you know great ideas that they think oh if I execute on this idea I could be a you know multimillionaire, but ninety nine percent of the time they don't move forward and execute on it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because a lot of them are 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 in a you know, W-2 job and they feel like, well, I can't, I can't leave my job. But so when you had your vision for Elucio, this kind of uh, point in time where you thought, oh, this would be a great device. And you researched the market and, and discovered that nobody was doing it yet. Um, what was your thought process? I mean, you, you basically burned the boats and you left and you basically said, I'm doing this. I'm going out on my own and doing this. Yeah, I, I actually, when I left the corporate, my, my position, I actually left because I had another idea that I thought was going to make it, which is completely unrelated to what I'm doing now. That idea did not make, I mean, I, we, I tried it, but yeah, I basically made the decision to leave what was a pretty cush situation to start something new. Mm -hmm. um, and for whatever reason, that one did not pan out. And I found myself thinking, do I want to, is there another great idea out there? Or do I go back to that W2 situation? Even if that one company wouldn't take me back, I'm sure I could have found somebody else. Sure. And for I safety. had, you know, I decided, no, I, I, I convinced myself, I want the freedom. I want the potential. I want the passion to follow a dream that emanated from my heart. Mm -hmm. um, and it probably was about a year until um, 
actually uh, our cousin, who is a plastic surgeon, had just done some surgery on my wife after having our, our two kids and realized, wow, it, this breast augmentation process is so, I mean, it's so antiquated. I mean, my wife really didn't have any idea what she wanted. And, and conversely, a surgeon plays, there's a lot of guessing work into picking an implant. Picking the size of an implant is really, really difficult. And to highlight that, I will tell you that um, it is very common for a surgeon to have four or five or six implant options, you know, different sizes of implants in the operating room. No kidding. They won't actually knew what one, you know, know which one to choose until their patients are, are open. Huh. You know, and, and just real quick, as a side thing, in your software, do you have kind of doctor side um, things that help the doctor once yeah. once the pay, they come to a consensus, helps the doctor technically to be able to know that they only need two inside the operating room versus? Yeah, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely, Mark. Um, yeah. You know, we started with one. There are all these you, when you're doing that kind of thing, you have to pay very close attention and do a lot of research to the existing patterns for implant selection. How do surgeons do it now? So you, you find different methodologies, mm -hmm. you know, these things that are printed in medical journals about, you know, um, sort of standards of care for various measurements and calculations and algorithms for picking out implants. So we had to look at all of those and say, what does our software align with that would enable us to do that for them? Mm -hmm. So we were able to come up with clinical data that would then be cross-referenced against a breast implant catalog. And, and now we've gone to the point where all of that's basically automatically done within our platform. It actually brings up a catalog of implants, Perfect. says these are the implants would fit that desired outcome for that specific patient. And now we're just launching, we just launched this past week in a, a brand new functionality, which is the ability to actually give the surgeon and patient volumetric data, which means, Here's the volume of your left breast. Here's the volume of your right. Here's the volume of your desired outcome breast. Mm -hmm. And here's the difference. So mm -hmm. yeah, there, there are so many real, real time, um, um, pragmatic indications from working in a 3D environment, which is, which is all really fun. You know, what's um, super interesting is that um, you come out of a public affairs, public relations background your partner, uh, Kyle, is a plastic surgeon. Neither of you have software development, computer science experience. Correct. So, and, and you're heading up a, a startup that is very focused on software. So I'd love, love it if you could talk for a little bit about how you put that piece of the puzzle together. Um, you know, anyone that's going in that, that's contemplating anything that has to do with computer programmers, um, it, you don't, you're probably right in um, having the right idea. Uh, people who are computer engineers typically don't have a lot of ideas. The ideas emulate from non-computer coders. There are incredible resources online and Silicon Valley dev firms. Now you find great developers in places like Brazil, Costa Rica, um, um, you know, Eastern European countries, Belarus, um, Romania, Russia, um, incredible resources that, that all operate on US time zone. They speak English, it's like they're down the street. And, um, and you don't have to be a, a computer genius to build a, build a software company. But, um, Did you, but, you have so to be, but you have to, you know, look out, you have to look out at every step on the game for your own best interest? Are they doing what you want them to do? Yeah. Are you ready to jettison one firm for another? Are you working with an independent consultant, independent contractor, or an agency? So it's, it's, it is constant. It is a constant challenge. It is constantly evolving. And no matter what anyone is building, you find someone to build the first rung of the ladder. And then you start envisioning what the next rung could be. And the guy who built the first rung, they may be able to get you there, or they may only be able to get you about 20% there. And then they just run out of, of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And you have to find someone else to come in and take over the reins. And you may have to do this. You know, we are probably on our 10th rung of this process. So you're on your 10th version of the software. 
Uh, yeah, sure. And, and for the sake of this conversation, yes. Right, right. And and so so really, you guys have operated so far without having a CTO, a, a, a chief technical officer that kind of oversees, that has a real knowledge, not necessarily is in the weeds doing the code, but really has like a real knowledge of 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 exactly what they're putting into your software and, wow. and putting it together. I've been really lucky. I, I'm with the same CTO that I had when I, he was my first person I, I gave equity to in the company. Okay. Um, and he was young, you know, he was like 25, right? At the time, now he's 32, Correct. but he's still just this young hotshot. He doesn't do a ton of the coding, but, he, but he's the visionary from, from the coding perspective. Mm. Sure. Sure. So and, you can tell him, hey, we want to step this up with this idea and he'll be able to translate it really from your end into and yeah. talk to the guys to, to try to make it happen. And if they can't technically get there, then you'll find you find somebody else who can. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. And, and, and with every entrepreneur, I, you know, my biggest piece of advice is listen to the market. No matter what you think, you know, when you start a new idea. I guarantee you, you do not know all of the facets. You know, mm-hmm. you can you could picture the most idealistic situation for where you want your new product to be. Um, if if you ever are lucky enough to make it very, you know, become successful, you probably weren't able to truly envision what got you to success because you didn't know what you didn't know. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you need to be able to adjust and move and pivot and and do all of those things from a strategic and a visionary perspective. And with, with each one of those adjustments, you may be talking about a different technology, which means yeah. different people who are coding. Well, that, that we were talking about Elon Musk earlier. And, and to me, I mean, maybe I'm completely wrong about this because I know Zach you know, is, 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 has much more knowledge about this guy, but it seems to me that he, he locks onto ideas and he's able to really keep that, that kind of, you know, that thread always. And, and yeah, maybe there's ins and outs as he's, they're figuring it out, but he really has that end goal in mind. He's very good at that. Do yep. you feel like, you know, maybe even before Illusio, but, but at least with this, with this company, was there a point when you really locked into the long-term vision of what this might be? And was that a big thing or was it just, Hey, we want to just have this little app that we you know want to bring to our local plastic surgeons, or did you already kind of envision like the market the big market at least in the u.s of plastic surgeons kind of yeah, taking I, it, taking it over i don't I, I think i probably always dreamt of this becoming you know sort of a, a standard communication tool right there are so many things in life where we could benefit from speaking visually i mean even right now you and i are communicating over zoom even though this is really just a conversation we could have on a phone for the most part but now we have a visual component to it um, there are so many things that could benefit from augmented reality at the next level, you know, go from zoom to the next level, which is like what we're doing with Illusio. Mm-hmm. And I think there are just so many applications. I, I like to think it's a lot bigger than breast hog, but Jesus, it, it has taken a long time just to crack this one. That's that learning curve, right? That's the, yeah. the you guys are out there, you know, on the bleeding edge. And what's great about that is if you can, if you can get really, really far out there and, and take the pain and take the hit somehow break through the guys behind you have so much of a, there's a barrier to entry just in that technical component of it. If you can control your, if you can control your patents, you know, there's a barrier to entry there that like you have a moat that almost in a lot of ways, you know, right. Yeah, it's interesting to mention the patents, obviously, with a lot of people who are listening, if they're thinking they have an idea that's unique, you know, IP protection or IP is a, is a big is a big component to that. And my advice is on that front, you know, there are a lot of patent attorneys, right? Every law firm has a patent department. There are people who specialize in it. And it, don't, think, don't think getting a patent, think patent strategy. Mm. You know, mm. find a really good attorney. I mean, Zach's an attorney. He can speak a lot to that much more than I can, but I can tell you that having worked with many different firms, large and small, um, finding so, somebody who really has a, a strategy for it, I think. When you say strategy, happens. you mean 
how do we best protect my business? It's not just one specific patent, but we want to protect this whole concept of virtual reality for whatever specific I, case. Yeah, I think it's somebody who doesn't look at, just like you were saying, it's not someone who thinks, okay, here's how I can get you a patent. It's more about your patent strategy is probably going to involve, if you have a good enough idea and it's sound and you have a patent attorney that agrees with you, this, the patent strategy will be evolving. It will evolve into a portfolio of patents. Mm. You'll have a very specific timeline in terms of what and when you want to patent. And a lot of it's not just based on, on protecting yourself. It's based on not letting somebody else hear about it, put something together, and, and they're smarter than you and their clock management. And they can actually become prior art and block you out of your own business. Hmm. So, you know, all of that is strategic wow. patent design. Interesting. Yeah. And as you do new iterations of your software, do you, are you constantly also updating your patents? No, no, we're not. Um, and, and in an ideal world, if we had, you know, if we were Apple or, or Tesla, maybe that's part of your strategy. And if, if anyone is listening and hasn't gone through the patent process, um, you know, working with a law firm, you're talking about, you know, probably twenty five to fifty thousand dollars to get each, something through. Yeah. So, so each time that you have an iteration, you, yeah, you know, if you wanted to go that strategy, you got to keep going back to the well, basically. Yes. Yes. You know, maybe that's a good lead in to talk a little bit about fundraising, which is such a critical component for startup businesses. Um, and maybe just as a lead in. Mark and I uh, own and run Prosperity CRE. We are a real estate investment company and we have investors, but it's structured differently than a startup company. So for us, uh, we do what are called syndications. So we bring in passive investors to invest alongside us when we have specific real estate investment opportunities. So for each property we purchase, we'll form a separate um, syndication to bring passive investors into that particular building. But for you, you, they're investing in your company and you have multiple rounds of investment opportunities. Right. And, and as opposed to real estate, you guys work off of a, a prospectus, right? Someone wants to, you're telling somebody, here's our return or annualize, or even do you do monthly return promises or Painting the picture of what someone can get in the mail every month based on their investment. Yeah, so we'll put together a uh, offering memorandum and we'll put together a, a very detailed kind of cash flow projection. Here's what you can expect to receive based off of our analysis each year during the holding period. And then if we meet our metrics, here's what we plan on selling it for when we go to market in five or seven years or whatever it is we project out. But that's a bit different than how you structure your you're off. Yeah, it's, it, there's a there's a definite there's a definite termination, uh, at least to the, the the plan that we go by now. Right. You have a five, seven, 10 year hold. There's an ending to it. And so the initial investors really aren't concerned about getting diluted by all new investors who might come in and in and, and, and the equity getting kind of spread out to new investors. Right. Because when you have an ongoing concern that, you know, that's what can happen. You know, if we held for 30 years, that might be, you know, that might be a concern. If we had to raise additional equity to keep the business or the property operating. Mm -hmm. but, I yeah. See. yeah, yours is a much safer play for, for an investor. They have a, a maybe it's not 100%, 100% you know, full proof, but, but when they, they invest with you guys, they know what they're going to get out of it, barring something going wrong. Is that about right? That's exactly it. Okay. But with exactly. you, the higher risk, higher potential reward, right? I mean, absolutely. And and the earlier in the process, the greater the risk, the greater potential for a reward or absolute bust. I mean, I am still so our company now we are raising at a uh, twenty five million dollar valuation. So you know we started at let's say two million, and we've gone all the way up to twenty five, and you're. Your value is only based, you know, valuation for a startup is, is entirely based off what is somebody willing to give you money 
you know, at what rate? <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Even, I saw Shark Tank. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. No matter you have a guy, you have an investor, and they may say, "Oh, have you been? What's your valuation?" They may a hundred million dollars, and where'd you get that number from? Well, I pulled it out of my, you know what, or maybe I hired and paid ten grand to a third party to come up with that, and and you know, Mark Cuban is going to go, I don't, I, I'll, I'll give it to you a 10 million valuation, one right. 10, and you want my money or not? And that's right. going to set the bar. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. that sets the bar. So you do that, that kind of negotiating with one major angel investor, but at some point you're going after multiple investors for the next level. So you've got to set the price, the valuation, at an amount that you think will attract all of the fundraising you need to do for that level. You set that number, Zach. And then once you start having the conversations with would-be investors, that number may move. Hmm. But so if it moves for one, it needs to move for all. You have to have parity for each round of investment. Okay. Exactly. Each round. For each, each round. round. Yeah. Right. If even if you know, Zach's my brother, if he told me, hey, I want to come in now and you know invest in my company. I can't give him any better terms than what I'm giving everybody else who's investing at this round. Right, right, right. right. Um, and, and, and as every investor knows, you know, you're going to come up short sometimes. You're going to be raising money um, probably far, far later than you should have, meaning you're raising when you're, the coffers are empty. And that's the worst time to raise money because the right. investors will smell you coming and they right. will. They will turn as they, they will squeeze as hard as they can. And you could have a down round, which is really tough or, you know, other really unpleasant terms. And, and then it gets into the guts of who that entrepreneur is. Are you willing to bleed a little bit in order to eventually become healthy and grow? I think so, most entrepreneurs aren't willing to do that. And those ideas fade away. When you say bleed a little bit. What do you mean? Pulling money out of your own pocket to keep the business uh, alive? Well, they could be pulling money out or not taking any money, you know, personally. I mean, I think I ran, I spent, I think I went an 18 month stretch on, that only ended at the end of 2020, where I went about 18 months without taking a penny. That's rough. That's rough. And those are the decisions that we all make. Is not If you're lucky enough that you can do it, then you make the decision Am I willing to put myself and my family through that? Do I believe in the vision enough? I mean, entrepreneurship, you know, make no doubt about it. It's for 95% of those who succeed. It's not for the faint of heart. It's, it's, it's a grind and it takes perseverance and yes. grit and determination. Yes. It's uh, and you know what I find interesting? I mean, people think we have such a like instant gratification mindset now in this country. We want to be rewarded right away, but it's a marathon. Mm -hmm. Having a startup business, being an entrepreneur is such a marathon. And it often, it's not a straight line from start to finish. It can be a long zigzag of trying to figure out where you're going. And right. setbacks and then repositioning yourself and just not quitting and having yeah. that stick-to-itedness. And depending on what level of funding you're on, people are making decisions based on different things, right? If you're looking for angel investment for a new idea, um, the idea counts. You who are selling the idea count more. So most angel investors and very early um, seed investors are probably looking at the entrepreneur more than the service or product that they're saying they can create. It's very similar to what we do. Oftentimes, I mean, and what we advise people who are interested in passively investing in real estate is you really need to prioritize looking at who the sponsor is, who the general partner is, and not just the pro forma projections that they gave you on how but great I, property is going to perform. Even though we don't typically do this, I would even venture to say that if we're talking about you know angels or seed investors, you know, they're even before we normally would bring investors on, right? They would be coming up to Zach and Mark and saying, hey, you know, I got an extra, I don't know, however much money that you can use in order to, to put down deposits on your next deal. But I want to be right next to you in that, 
you know, the like, whole time rather yeah, than like a stack, right? I don't know what you're going to buy, but here's some money. And I want to be, buy. and I want to be part of the general partnership. I don't want right. to be a limited partner in the next round where you're raising all the capital. I want, I want that equity that you guys have, yeah. you know, that, that, the. And if you can bring a big name that's recognizable and, and brings value that way, then right then you go to other would-be investors and you can say, well, you know, we've got, we got Joe Smith and they're going to be, wow, he's with you guys. And that brings so much credibility to mm. whatever it is you're offering. So those, those whale investors are so great to have if you can find them other than just the money. Yeah. Right. Oh, now yeah. you you have a pretty well known. I don't you know want to say a name if you're not comfortable. With, you have a pretty well known angel investor. Why don't you tell the story about kind of how you put yourself out there in the competition and how you got discovered and how we approached you? Yeah. So in the beginning of anyone who's starting something, starting a company, there are a lot of opportunities to enter startup competitions, and they could be competitions through incubators, accelerators. Um, or just you know one-off competitions where you submit a plan or a three-minute pitch. Um, if you're lucky, you get through the first filtering system. So I entered one that was based down in San Diego. It was put on by a 3D printing company and um, basically a small family of investors that put on these competitions to identify cool companies to invest in at a very early age. The prize money was, I think it was $15,000. But you were doing actually, more for the exposure than like 15000 Exactly. So I did this thing. I actually forgot. It's funny because I forgot I had submitted to it. And, and I got a call <laughs> like 24 hours prior to the oh, actual competition. And I didn't realize I had, to, I had to be there tomorrow. And thankfully, it was about an hour drive for me. So I'm like, oh, and I had no one to go with me. So it was, I had to go by myself, go down to San Diego, get on a stage. I had to put together like a 10 page PowerPoint. But it was so early. I don't think I had a prototype product. It was just an idea and, and some PowerPoint and some images. But I go down there and, and you know, I do my pitch. Um, nervous as hell. Don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know who I'm speaking to. I didn't really do research on my audience. And somebody came up to me afterwards and said, I was really interested in what you just presented. I have a colleague who comes out of I'll say his name because he's he's an actual advisor to the company. So he says, my, my colleague's name is Ray Lane. He's from Oracle. Acted as if I knew who he was. And I didn't. I had no idea. So I give him my card and I say, great, thanks. And, and I leave. The next day, I found out that I had actually made it down to one of the finalists. And I eventually ended up winning that competition. Nice. And they gave me one of those giant you know, yes. cut out checks, which was sort of cool. <laughs> like happy Gilmore, you know, throwing this, this huge check in my car, taking it awesome. to the bank. Um, but um, uh, lo and behold, this guy, Ray, his office calls me up not too long later and invites me and, and my, my cousin, uh, Dr. Song, to come up to his, his house to show him what we have. And um, it ends up- and At that really time, did you have a prototype? I guess I did. You're right. I did a prototype because we went to his house and we showed him. Mm -hmm. So it was an early stage prototype of it. And he loved the idea. And really, we just all got along well. It was the day before Christmas Eve, so December 23rd. And we spent probably over an hour together. And um, so Ray ran Oracle with Larry Ellison as a COO for about nine years. Wow. And then he spent some time with the chairman at Hewlett Packard. Then he spent about 10 years as a I think a managing director at Kleiner Perkins, which is one of the top venture capital firms. Right. And now he has his own venture capital firm. So Ray's one of those guys that knows everything about startup businesses and way, way, way beyond that. Um, and, and you know, we were just really lucky that we that, that he took a liking to us and our technology. He made a sizable investment. The next round came and he signed up again, made another right. investment. Then I said, Ray, I, it would be great if you can advise us as an official advisor. At that point, he was already you know, on my speed dial, picking up when I called him. He was pretty right. much a mentor at the time. Fantastic. So he became great. an advisor to the company. And now, flash forward about five years, and I don't know why he stays with us, but he, he does. He has introduced us, and only about a year ago, to a bunch of his buddies who are all in that same 
Silicon Valley or what have you, big time investors. And, and then, you know, these guys are, are friends. Mm -hmm. So now I've got this network of investors with incredible amounts of resources and more importantly, knowledge. So as a group, they're sort of all acting as my mentor, my advisors, my investors. And to be honest, I'm not really envisioning spending a lot of time developing other relationships. It's enough of a network. I'm lucky. I can just go right to my core guys. Do you feel like things accelerated for you after kind of breaking through that portion of it in terms of not just the, the company itself, but like you said, you know, having that network and, and really, I, I guess, truing up your knowledge or um, your I wish your, I would have a lot. I, I probably wish I would have grown that network out sooner in the game. I spent, I spent five years doing this until I really hit this group. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've gotten out of them is more than anything else, you know, solid, advice saying, you guys have a great idea. You're building a decent company. You're not scaling yet. Mm. We know how to scale. We know how to find investors. We know what the story is that needs to be told to get you to the next level. And it's not based on anything that I had experienced before. You know, specifically, it's not based on, on organic growth. It's, it's a model for investment growth which is what venture capital firms and private equity firms look at. And it has to do not only with revenues, but how are you spending investment dollars to scale to reach revenue? Break it down to where, if I make, if I get $10 million, where is it going to go? How are you going to spend that 10 million? Don't take our money and put it in the bank, take it and spend it. So you can take your $25 million company and become a 250 million and then a larger so there are methods to this madness. You know, there are acceptable ranges of, 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 of matrix that, that, that truncate categories like full-time employees against annual recurring revenue ratios in different departments of the company. Now, mm -hmm. these are things that I would not have known on my own, but it's what the next level, the Series A and Series B investors, it's what they expect. That's so so that's, to your point, Mark, that's what is, that's the value of these guys that I'm getting. And, and the money's but, not bad either. <laughs> but going back to, you said that, that you spent five years, you know, uh, before you really kind of, kind of made inroads here. What would you, what, like looking back, what would you have done differently? Like, like you say it as if you could have done something very specific earlier on to, to make that breakthrough. And sometimes you know, sometimes people look, look back and go, I have no idea what happened, but here I am, you right. know, and, and I don't know what I, I could have done, but I think it, it's helpful to know along the way, like, you know what, I need to get my ass out of the house and get down to the meetups because that's where the breakthroughs are going to happen or whatever it is. I'm just throwing that out there, but yeah. Do you know what I mean? I don't like, know that there was any, and I, I mean, it seems like the easiest question, right? What would you have done differently? Yeah. I, I don't know. Everything seems to have been part of a process. Well, so in hindsight, out of it, and then the process changes. And without yeah. the full process, like I would have known where my technology had to change in order to get me where I am today. That's, that's what I was going to probably ask is, Hey, were you spending your time? Like, like me, I'm, you know, for me, I, I made a big role change from from you know the entertainment industry, something completely different than real estate and business and, and stuff like that. But there was a portion of my time that I really was like, I need to hit the books and I need to become really, really good at something very specific in what I what I want to do so that I can bring value, whatever. And so I definitely carved out a period of time that maybe I wasn't, you know, I mean, I was doing some of the things, but but maybe not as much as really kind of you know, nose to the grindstone type of thing. And so I wonder yeah. if that was, if it, that was something that you were going through where you, you just had to catch up a little bit with your vision and, and the technology and the business and all that stuff before you could really know, you know, and, you know the spot. The, the, I'll, really quickly, the, the, the one thing, and this, this is advice to anyone who's starting out. And, and this is, it goes in line with everybody who has succeeded in the past with this stuff. It's going to take a lot longer and you're going to need a lot more funding. 
to succeed. And you know, in hindsight, it probably was the expectations of what was needed. That process can't change. You can't know how to pivot your technology until you get feedback from the market. So it, you, there's just no way around that. There's mm-hmm. no way around that. You mm-hmm. can't, and, and when you make those pivots, you can't know how much money you need until you find out how much it is to develop the new crap that these users are telling you, you know, you need. So, you know, managing expectations would be great, but it's, there are so many unknowns. Yeah, it's the unknown unknowns. And where it sounds like where your business really started to have that hockey puck trajectory is when you brought in these advisors, these venture capitalist advisors who could advise you and say, here's how we recommend really 10x in your business. You need to look at how you're spending your capital. Yes. And, but that's an unknown unknown for you. You would have you wouldn't have been able to figure out that unless you had those advisors in place to advise you on that. Yeah. I mean, you're right, Zach, that you don't know what you don't know. The unknowns, these are not things to be afraid of. These are things to embrace. Right. And, and a, good, a good CEO, a good head of a company, a good entrepreneur, what makes them good is not only passion and the ability to say, I'm going to go raise money, I'm going to find people to build my dream, but the ability to recognize that idea that I hadn't had myself and I haven't heard before has a heck of a lot of merit. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I can't just let it go from one ear and out the other. You know, someone who's going to be good in leadership recognizes something good coming in and says, wait a minute, that's really interesting. Let me look into that. You know, like I was talking to you, Zach, just last week about another complimentary, you know, application for what we do in Breast Dog for another industry. It was one of these great advisors that made that, that, you know, brought that concept to my mind, but it, but it was easily identifiable as a, don't let that one go so quickly. Let me, right. let me think, let me yeah. call my brother, Zach. He's a smart guy. Let me bounce the idea off him. Let mm-hmm. me do that to five other people. And, 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 and if, if, it, if it sounds like it has legs, you know, now rock and roll. And maybe right. all of a sudden the idea you thought you had, which was going to be this $250 million idea, maybe there's a way to get it way above that. Yeah, you just, yeah, you have to be aware and always listening mm-hmm. and being able to recognize where the opportunity is and right. be ready to pivot. I love that. Right. And, and the minute you pivot into any unknown area, the, the very best thing you could do is, is tell yourself, I don't know crap about this. I better find myself some experts and I better, I better learn. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's another thing for your investors, you guys, me, myself is, and and none of us, let's face it. We're all in the second half of our lives. Right. But we need to still embrace the unknown and say, we, we could still learn. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. For sure. Constant learning. Yeah. It's like we all try to teach our kids. They don't want to learn it. They think they know everything at that <laughs> age. You get to be our age and we realize we don't know diddly squat. That's right. That's very true. What is, um, so, so in terms of, uh, of your company, like um, I guess, uh, what, what are the plans, just the overall plans? I mean, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've thought about it, but is it something that you, you want to spend, you know, are you positioning it to possibly, get it in the best shape as possible and, and as much earnings, you know, within the next 10 years to, to position it for sale, or is it your forever company that you'll always be a part of and, and help run? Like, wh- where do you stand with all of that? I'm, I'm way too old to want to be running a company in 20 years. No, I want to exit. <laughs> and I think every entrepreneur probably has these visions of this awesome exit. Right. And then the question is, how do you put together a strategy that takes you to that? Right. So, no, no, right. I didn't. If I'm lucky enough, I can have a few exits out of one company. So that's another cool thing about new ideas. You can spin off divisions. Mm, yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it's all fun. It's all fun to think about and, and try to do different things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been great. I really appreciate your coming on the show. Yeah. It's been but fantastic, man. Just fascinating. You know, it's been fun. And if any, anybody who hears this, um, is really interested in this kind of stuff. I mean, I, I open my, my email up if you guys share this stuff. Sure. What's the best yeah. way for folks to get in touch with you? 
Uh, best one is my my work email, which is which is Ethan at illusioimaging.com. Mm -hmm. cool. And we'll I put welcome that on in the show notes. With me. And if I could help out, just like this executive program at UCSB. And when you when you when you first just like you guys, when you first started out this, you have this new endeavor with your podcast. You have your investment real estate investment company. Um, I'm sure there are things that you wish you knew in the beginning that you didn't that would have helped. Definitely. So, and Definitely. I'm sure you guys feel the same way, right? If you could reach others and make their life a little bit better, you know, you would. You know, it's so funny uh, not to kind of get too far off a, on a tangent, but like somebody, uh, one of my mentors actually was, was talking uh, to me about this, about how, you know, we're all kind of experts in our fields. And the interesting thing is, is we can be as little as say six months ahead you know, in knowledge of somebody and as far back as however, young people or whatever, and, and still make a difference to help, a, you know, another person really e evolve and make big giant leaps. And I love that, right? Because yeah. then you, the, you always have a, a point where you can make an impact. And that's really like, to me, that's very important knowing yeah. that even if somebody seems like, you know, they're just a little bit behind, I can still maybe make an impact. So don't try to withhold everything or, or, or stop giving, you know? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah. You think about mentoring others. Maybe there's a preconceived notion that, you know, it's somebody who's 60 mentoring someone who's 30. Right. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't right. have to be that. Right. Yeah. The gray hair teaching. Yeah, exactly. That's right. the, you know, that's the X, Y, Z of this, this whole thing. But in, in reality, you know, the Y's and the Z's actually it, it can reverse that as well in, in this too. And, you know, we're, we're, we didn't forget the baby boomers. They just don't have a letter attached to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that we <can> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I don't want to, I know the clock's ticking, but I'll say one other thing. And this is, I'm, I have a passion about this, this next item, which is, you know, if we're talk, talking about mentoring and, and helping younger people, step up and succeed in whatever they want to do. And hopefully at some point make investments in companies like yours and companies like mine, um, you know, their ability to communicate is, is, totally. is being totally impacted by social media mm -hmm. and the technology of today's world. And um, we have, we're all, it's going to, I don't know if you guys listen to Simon Sinek. Do you know Simon no. Sinek? No. Sinek is, a, is one of these communication gurus who has all kinds of great TED Talks and online platforms mm -hmm. where he's speaking to the leaders of tomorrow. And he's helping you define what a company is. In fact, for, if there is an entrepreneur listening to this, uh, I would highly advise you to YouTube or Google Simon Sinek. I think it's S-I-N-E-C-K. That's an unsolicited <laughs> plug I'm giving. And mm -hmm. type in Simon Sinek. Um, the um, the what, how, why. Okay. okay. Which is basically, how do you define your company? Is it what you do? Mm. Is it how you do it? Or is it why you do it? Mm. Great companies are not defined by what they do. And they're not defined by how they do it. They are entirely defined by why do they do it? You know, so it's I'm just... talking about cause-based. I'm talking about why are you doing it? And do, can people relate and understand and appreciate the dream of why you're doing it? You know, it's so interesting, like Tesla is, their stock price is going through the roof and now Elon's the richest man ever, right? Right. And he started Tesla not to make a crap load of money, but he wanted to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. So from day one, he had his why, and that was the mission of the company. Exactly. That, that's a great example. You know, what did, what did Tesla do? I mean, if we're just looking at the car company, built the cars the first one no first one to do an electric car no you know how did he do it was he doing it in such an innovative fashion you know people who understand the technology might make an argument yes that's that's it but were people buying it because of how he was making his cars mm -mm. no it, you're right zach it was the why and they understood as part of this bigger picture of a sustainable planet mm -hmm. Right. And I think people bought into that dream and they, and, and, and Tesla became almost synonymous with this concept. Mm -hmm. And then with solar city, which is Tesla energy now. Right. And, you know, of course, SpaceX, which is an extension of all of that stuff into the outer realms. And, you know, now we have 
you know, what's going to happen to these iPhones when the Tesla, what is it, the Tesla Model Pi? Hmm. You know what's about the this? Model, what's the Model Pi? The Model Pi is uh, is Tesla's new phone. Oh, I didn't know they're doing a phone. It looks, it's going to be a direct competitor, mostly to the iPhone. The big difference is it's entirely satellite based. Interesting. Oh yeah, he's been putting up his satellites, but I had read that the satellites he's putting up and his satellite system is mostly targeted for rural and third world countries. The speed is much faster with you know hooking it up through your cable. It's he's going to be mad scientist. Well, the latest numbers I saw, like an Iridium satellite phone, which is available now, has about a 2.5, maybe 2.8 gigabyte mm -hmm. per second transfer rate. Um, his phones are going to have about a 230, which is going to compete with cell service. Okay. So it's 24-7, as fast as cellular service, as cheap as cell service. Hmm. But his phones will all be satellite. And then there's all kinds of other interconnectivity. Interesting. You know, bells and whistles. I, I think he's using the satellite. I was thinking about the internet access, but you're talking about satellite for phones. Right. The satellite system that's constantly orbiting the Earth and right. uh, at 133 satellites or something. Right. 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 Yeah. That's when is that coming out? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe next. I've seen prototypes of it. So maybe as early as a year. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you, 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 we talked about Apple taking over everything. So I draw, I, I talked about Apple in the world of augmented reality, because if you're um, creating 3D scanner technology two years ago and getting $25 million in investment yeah. to build hardware, well, yeah. all of that hardware is pretty much obsolete now, two years totally. later, because it's on every iPhone. Totally. Are you, for any of your next iterations, are you looking at um, developing your technology like on blockchain so you don't, don't have to rely on Apple, for example? No. Um, predominantly because relying on Apple is a, is a pretty safe bet. Now, maybe... Tesla can will we'll shake that up, but but nobody else shakes that up. And if anybody else, you know, um, contrasts or comes up against Apple, Apple wins. Mm -hmm. So are there and more and more software is becoming SDK based, right? So you have all of these really cool tools and features that you can integrate into your technology. And if it's part of Apple, there's a good chance it's going to be absolutely free. Is there a fully functioning kind of um... I guess, blockchain operating system at this point? Because you'd need the operating system and you need a chip, right? Those I two don't know kind of any, main components. You, know, you may know more about that than I do, Mark. I you know, know, yeah, I I'm know. not a tech guy, but but I suspect from what I've read, the answer is no one. And my greater comfort that that's not at least a near-term possibility is that the smart people that I speak with all the time on the tech side, no one's ever raised that as a... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm as a potential concern. The bigger concern is if you're gonna rely on anything that you're paying for or paying to develop, make sure that it isn't already free or going to be free shortly through Apple. Yeah. Interesting. That's, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, they're, they're, they, they innovate. It, it's just unbelievable how quickly they innovate. And once the hardware is created, the software catches up quickly. And and what's you, your favorite? How can, you, how can you benefit from that in your, you know, and what you do? I mean, certainly 3D scanning real estate is is already a thing. Yeah, I mean that that portion of it, obviously, you know, the systems that are involved with what we do heavily rely on, you know, computer based programs all the way around. You know, from property management software to rent collection and billing software. Yeah. You know, other. Um, Title, title work right now, which is becoming, we're, we're able to now pretty securely DocuSign um, all the way up the chain. I, we can't really DocuSign deeds right now, but we're getting very close to being able to, to you know, uh, have DocuSign notaries and things like that. Wow. There have that, been that's, some that's one area where it's going to be really disruptive in real estate is switching things like escrow and title over to the blockchain. It's going to make it much more efficient and much more uh, secure. But you know what? I agree with that. And that's really where I've been like waiting for that. But I just actually read an article and it was a contrarian view 
where they actually tried a, a couple of counties in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and had much difficulty, not with the technology. It actually was proven to speed up the transaction times. Yeah. It was it was with the the counties themselves because there resi there was resistance in the possibility that the people the whole departments these record title recording departments could be basically did they could disappear and um, there was really resistance on that end. Sure, um, but they did sure. do some really successful uh, experiments on blockchain and commercial real estate out in um, I think it's in the country of Georgia. And um, it was very successful, except for they don't necessarily have the most stable, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to say government, they do have a stable government, but, but um, there's a lot of co corruption, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so even if you have blockchain there, it, it goes a long way to try to help that, but it's not perfect when you have people. So is, is blockchain not susceptible at all to hacking? By the nature I don't know of if it's, I mean, I just don't have the technological background to say if it's not susceptible at all, but my understanding is because of the way blockchain works and you have, you know, instead of one computer hacking into, you have thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers all with the same ledger verifying the transaction. It makes mm -hmm. it much, much less susceptible to, to fraud. Yeah. 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 My understanding exactly that is, is that the idea is, is, is many nodes that you can have out there as possible starts to diminish the chances of, of somebody entering in and, and changing something without a complete, complete identical copy or more being there to back it up. That's, you know, and so, but there have been quite a few man in the middle type of uh, attacks, you know, on Bitcoin and other uh, very large coin, which right, is concerning. Right. You know. Well, I think more and more is going to go in that direction. I mean, that going back to that uh, test the phone, I remember that was one one of the capabilities they were touting was the ability to manage whatever the whatever the, the the cryptocurrency is that Elon Musk is behind. You know, having that all streamlined on the phone. Ah, so you can the, you mean the kind of like Twitter where you can transit send Bitcoin to other countries right now on Twitter? He's going to have some. Oh, I'm sure it's all about, yeah, I'm sure it's about managing your wallet straight through some cryptocurrency that's that you can do on your phone. So the phone becomes a, you know, replacement to the wallet altogether mm -hmm. within that currency base. I'll tell you, you know, all the people that are talking about the, the, the 666 and all that stuff and worried about the, you know, the, the, the signs and everything, like we're walking around with it at all times. So just. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I mean that that's it. We've already accepted it. Everybody has it. Yes. We may <laughs> so, not know what we don't know, but someone out there knows everything. <laughs> and, uh, right, this has been right. great, man. This has been yeah, fantastic. Been terrific. I yeah. appreciate it. It's nice meeting you, Mark. And yeah, Zach, exactly. always good talking. You too. Well, thanks very much. And thanks everyone for listening in and stay tuned for the next episode. 10X for Gen XYZ is hosted by Zach Winner and Mark Adair Rios co-founders of Prosperity CRE, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and building long-term wealth. If you like the podcast, please give us a positive rating and subscribe to be notified about future content. Also, if you'd like to learn more about our approach to real estate investing, you can download a free copy of our real estate investment book, Investing for Cash Flow and Long-Term Wealth, by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thank you and stay tuned for our upcoming episodes.